Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the second online edition of the Richmond and Teddington Wine Society's video tasting. For those of you that tuned in to the New Zealand tasting last month will know what to do. You should have your wine tasting glasses ready, the wines ready and opened and all, be all primed and set for an even more extensive tasting today. In just a moment I'm going to taste uh, this Prosecco with you. Um, but you may have some Prosecco already poured in anticipation of the event. Uh, but before that happens, there's going to be a short overview of the areas, geography and wines that we're going to cover just for a moment or two. Our focus is on three of the seven regions on the map, Veneto, Piedmont and Friuli Venezia Giulia. Veneto is the largest wine production area in Italy with around 94 million cases per year. This is mainly thanks to the Galera grape, which makes Prosecco, and accounts for nearly 25% of volume. Galera is followed by Garganega, the key grape in Suave, Pinot Grigio, Merlot and Corvina, the not so well known, but the key grape in Valpolicella. Piedmont is Italy's seventh biggest production area, but makes about a fifth of the Veneto. Piedmont is best known for the twin titans of Barolo and Barbaresco, and the whites and sparkling of Gavi and Asti. Principal grapes in terms of volume are Barbera, Moscato, Dolcetto and Nebbiolo, as well as Cortese, which makes Gavi. Friuli Venezia Giulia sits just behind Piedmont in production terms, but only 13% of Veneto's output. Nearly 80% is white, driven by Glera again for Prosecco, but also for Pinot Grigio, and some of Italy's finest examples are from this region. Merlot and the lesser known Friano grape also feature. Before we start the main tasting, I want to take a quick look at the Prosecco map. The main Prosecco DOC area is huge, encompassing all of Friuli Veneto Giulia and a large section of the Veneto. We all know how popular Prosecco is, and we saw it first hand on our tour to the region last year, the vast seas of green glare vineyards that dominate the landscape. However, the Prosecco we are tasting is a DOCG the highest quality level, and only produced in a very small hilly area around Azolo, Corneliano and Val d'Obiadene. Very small quantities are made, but it is definitely worth paying the extra to experience the higher quality. So before we start the tasting proper, um, a quick word about Prosecco. Now, many of you, in fact, I'm sure all of you will be familiar uh, with Prosecco to some degree. Um, and we visited the region last year on tour and you get to see at first hand the enormous acreage, hectares upon hectares upon hectares uh, of flat plains uh, growing the Galera grapes that uh, now make Prosecco. However, what we have here is an Azolo Prosecco Superiore. So this is uh, DOCG wine, so the highest quality level that you can get uh, of all Italian wines, and it applies to a very small area within the Prosecco zone, which covers a huge tract of the Veneto and the Friuli Venezia Giulia area. So this is um, pretty much you know, one of the best Proseccos around. Uh, and what typifies the quality and what differentiates this wine from your standard Prosecco um, is not the colour, because it looks absolutely the same as any other Prosecco, very light, very pale, uh, lots of great bubbles, small and fine and persistent. It's the nose straight away which is really intense, uh, a lovely purity, lovely clean nose, uh, and very floral, uh, perhaps more intensely floral than your typical Prosecco. Palette-wise, again, a lovely clean, fresh taste. That floral character comes out in the palette very much as well. And also what differentiates uh, this from perhaps a, an eight, a normal Prosecco, lovely length, great finish, uh, resound without being too powerful. So this is an upmarket, more serious version that retains all that delicacy, that floral characteristic, freshness uh, and delight of Prosecco. Now, we're not going to do the whole tasting outside because as many of you will know, I'm not a huge fan uh, of uh, tasting wines outside. So we're gonna head inside now. So let's get on with the tasting. The first two wines we're gonna taste are the Suaves. We are going to compare and contrast two Suaves. The first one is from the Cantina de Monteforte, situated close to the historic walled town of Suave, which is 20 kilometers east of Verona, 
This cooperative has 1,200 hectares, located in some of the best locations of the region, 600 growers, and harvests around 20,000 tonnes per year, equating to 4 million bottles. The area benefits from cool breezes sweeping down from the Alpone Valley, and volcanic soils give the wine richness and minerality. The wine is made from 100% Garganaga. The second wine is from the family-owned Pierapan estate. They have made wine since the 1890s and were the first producer to put the name Suave on the label. The family property is in the heart of the historic town and we had the pleasure of tasting their wines on the rooftop terrace on our Verona tour in 2010. Pierapan rank as one of the world's most renowned winemakers and their La Rocca Suave regularly wins top awards at international wine competitions. So the first one is the 2019 Suave Classico from the Cantina de Monteforte. Now, colour-wise, as you might expect, very pale, lemony gold, and then giving a swirl, to me, very clean, very fresh, um, lovely citrus notes, uh, and for once, uh, a Suave that actually smells of something. And I think this is one of the big problems with Suave, is that its image. Uh, and historically, there have been many, many examples of very bland, very innocuous, very dull wines. Uh, that is changing. Uh, Suave is still a huge uh, production wine, uh, but it's really a question of seeking out the good examples. So lovely clean fresh aromas. And then on the palate, nice fresh acidity. Again, drawing up some nice uh, citrus uh, flavours as well. And also a little hint of oiliness just coming through as well, but nice, clean, refreshing finish. So that was the 2019 finish. <laughs> that was the 2019 vintage. Let's just very quickly move on to the 18, uh, which is in half bottle. And I think uh, in comparison with the 19, slightly deeper in colour, as you might expect, a year's of age, one year of extra age. Uh, we'll just deepen the wine a little bit. And on the nose, a little bit more developed, um, still uh, clean. Um, but more a sense of uh, a little bit of marzipan, perhaps, uh, a little bit of oiliness coming through. Uh, Palette-wise, still fresh, clean, nice development of uh, fruit on the palate. Lovely weight, lovely balance, lovely harmony, nice acidity, long finish. And I think the key difference between the two is that 19, perhaps just a little bit fresher, but the 18 has a little bit more weight, uh, a little bit more richness. Uh, which I think is very much the case with a lot of Suaves uh, of high quality, they develop over time in the bottle. Now, my suggested cheese pairing uh, with the uh, Suave Monteforte is called Dolce di Marema. So it's a Tuscan semi-soft cow's milk cheese. Uh, this is the cheese. Um, so as you can see, uh, lovely little sort of semi-soft. And technically, the acidity of the Suave just cuts through nicely. Cheers. So the second one we're going to taste is the Suave Classico from Pierrepan. And we're going to taste the 2019 vintage first. And you know, I've already talked a, a little bit uh, about the Pierrepan estate, but lovely family owned. Uh, we visited there in 2010 uh, on uh, several wine tours. Uh, and it's, they have the most beautiful house uh, with a fantastic rooftop terrace uh, overlooking the historic walled town of Suave. So this is the 2019 Suave Classico, uh, and again, as you might expect, it's unoaked, uh, all stainless steel fermentation, uh, and very sort of pale lemony gold in colour. Now on the nose, uh, it's clean and fresh, it just feels a little bit closed, um, so yeah, not yielding perhaps as much uh, intensity fruit as you might expect, but there's plenty there. Uh, but again, clean, citrus, fresh, um, you know, nicely aromatic. Palette-wise, there's a lovely freshness, um, almost a hint of a little prickle of CO2, uh, just a, a light pétillance almost, um, and then nice, clean, crisp finish. So lovely balance, lovely harmony, uh, lovely sort of uh, weight, but feel a sense of more to come from this wine. Then tasting the 2018 uh, Suave Classico from Pierrepin, uh, in a similar vein to the Monteforte, slightly deeper in colour. But then what comes through on the nose is that extra depth that we experience both with the, uh, the Monteforte, but here once again, 
so there's a, there's a richness, uh, sort of less sense of, of, of a closed nose. Um, and this is now full of you know, ripe fruit, uh, spice, uh, and again, this little sort of hint of oiliness that I think is uh, uh, prevalent in a lot of very good sort of suaves. Palette wise, lovely depth, real super intensity, just keeps on going and going. Um, absolutely delicious. And again, you know, testament to the fact that really good suave does benefit from maybe a year or two even, uh, even at this sort of level uh, of, of aging. Now, a great cheese match uh, that I've suggested is from the Veneto region, uh, and it's the Cacciatona di Capra al Fieno. Uh, and this is a straw wrapped uh, goat's milk cheese. Uh, and again, what we're looking for is the acidity just to sort of cut through the richness of the cheese. It's not too powerful in taste, so the sort of the relatively delicate flavour of the suave should just marry harmoniously with this cheese. Food-wise, with both the Suave Classicos, uh, my recommendation would be a butternut squash or ravioli. Obviously, making your own pasta, a um, little bit of butter and sage sauce, I think would complement this wine absolutely perfectly. All the recipes that I talk about are available on my blog, uh, as well as the download that you may already have. Our third one is the Garbi de Garbi from La Justiniana. This estate has a wonderful old palace that dates back to 1603. They make just three wines from their 40 hectares of vines, all from 100% Cortese grapes. The Garvi de Garvi Lugarara is a single vineyard wine from vineyards within the Garvi commune itself, hence the Garvi de Garvi name. The wine is unoaked and was bottled in the spring following the harvest. And uh, this is a famous estate, dates back, the, well, the palace of La Justiniana dates back to 1603. But for me, the interest is in the grape variety, the Cortese grape. Very much a grape variety that is great in Garvey and surrounding areas in Piedmont, uh, but has not found any success at all outside of a relatively small area. So um, just looking at the wine, uh, again, like so many Northern Italian whites, uh, again, this is unoaked, uh, very sort of pale lemony gold in colour. And on the nose, again, clean, fresh, lovely sort of crisp, clean aromatic, uh, quite floral in fact, you know, sort of white flowers, a little bit of sort of white pepper. Um, and again, this is a great example. There are a lot of garbies out there that, you know, don't have this intensity, don't have this concentration. Uh, and that's always what you're looking for with Cortese, which is a relatively sort of neutral grape variety. On the palate, Nice weight, nice texture. Now the wine has also had a little bit of time, just a few months, a little bit of lees stirring. And I think this adds a little bit of weight, a little bit of texture to the wine. But overall, lovely balance, you know, good weight, good freshness, nice acidity, good finish. Now turning to the Garvey, the Garvey 2018 in half bottle, uh, very similar in colour to the 2019, pale lemony gold, um, as you might expect, the same production method, all stainless steel fermentation. Uh, Nose-wise, lovely purity of fruit, uh, really clean uh, sense of sort of uh, stones and uh, white flowers, uh, but lovely in concentration. And I think that sort of uh, that you know, chalky volcanic soil sort of comes to the fore here. Um, so lovely, clean, fresh nose. And then palate-wise, lovely intensity. Again, lovely sort of mouth-filling sort of sense. A uh, little coating over the teeth, mouth and gums. Um, yeah, absolutely dry, uh, lovely texture. Um, and again, this is to me is quite sort of, you know, citrus and that sort of, there may be a little hint of sort of stone fruit coming through. Uh, lovely length, lovely finish. Um, absolutely super. Uh, cheese wise, um, what I would highly recommend uh, is Taleggio. Now again, a regional cheese from Bergamo. And what we have here is, as you can see, uh, the absolutely classic sort of uh, uh, orange rind here of Taleggio. Soft cow's milk cheese. And again, this lovely acidity of the Cortese will just cut through uh, the Taleggio absolutely perfectly. As far as recipes are concerned for the Garvey, 
uh, I could think of nothing better than a little bowl of grilled tiger prawns with lots of garlic. Our next wine is the Pinot Grigio from Livio Faluga 2018. We had the pleasure of visiting the Livio Faluga winery last year on tour. The tasting was hosted at the historic Abbazia Rosazzo, a 2000 year old monastery in one of the most elegant tasting rooms we've ever experienced. The fruit for their Pinot Grigio comes from the most historic vineyards in the region, fermented in stainless steel, and the wine spent six months on its lees prior to bottling. The specific subzone, Colli Orientali, is where some of Italy's finest Pinot Grigios are produced. So, tasting the Pinot Grigio, but before we do that, just a quick word about Pinot Grigio and also Livio Faluga. Pinot Grigio, as we all know, um, I think there's many of us have many terms of reference uh, for large amounts of innocuous, bland, dull tasting Pinot Grigio. This is nothing like that. Uh, Livio Faluga, as you've already heard, uh, family owned estate, uh, long established, and one of the top producers in the region. And I think what differentiates this or his Pinot Grigio is the depth, the intensity, the flavour. And uh, first of all, colour wise, as you might expect, 2018, a little bit of uh, age, a little bit of a uh, little bit of colour, but not much. Um, it spent six months on the leaves before being bottled. Um, and I think straight away on the nose, you get this depth, you get this texture, you get this weight uh, that is so uncharacteristic, so many of the much cheaper Pinot Grigios out there. Um, so, and again, there's something they're definitely floral, a little bit of aromatic, but there's a depth and weight as well in the nose as, as well. Palette wise, that sort of depth and intensity from the nose translates through into the palette. Um, nice concentration, super weight, something also a combination, curious of both floral and also something ever so slightly sort of there's minerality there, also something that's slightly savory. Um, so a lovely sort of combination of flavours, but what is particularly pronounced is the finish. Now, I have to say, we visited um, the, let's say, the Livia Faluga estate. What they do is they take you to the Abbazia Rosazzo. Now, this is a 2,000-year-old abbey, um, Cistercian monks, <clears throat> not long, no longer, no, no monks there now, but fantastic history and it has one of the most beautiful tasting rooms that we've ever experienced the tasting in in all the tours we've done over the last 20 years. Um, fantastic views over all the vineyards uh, and they, they manage the Abbey's estates and uh, it was a, a truly magical experience. Now, uh, so hopefully as you're tasting it, uh, you know, this is both full bottle and a half bottle size, uh, you're getting a really perhaps a different impression of what Pinot Grigio can all be about. As far as food's concerned, this would be a fantastic wine to go with uh, an Italian cheese called Torta. Now, this is layers of uh, mascarpone, gorgonzola and dolce latte. And again, that, that uh, lovely acidity and freshness would cut through it. And food-wise, my recommendation uh, is some grilled salmon uh, with some sort of, uh, what, sitting on a bed of leeks, uh, a little bit of parsley sauce. Our next wine, is the Val Policella 2018 from the Cantina Val Pantena, just to the north of Verona. Our Val Policella comes from the Val Pantena Cooperative, situated just to the northeast of Verona. Regarded as a standard bearer of cooperative wineries and aided by cool dolomite breezes and characteristic poor chalky soils, they produce very high quality wines from their 700 hectares of vines. This wine comprises 75% Corvina and 25% Rondinella grapes and is stainless steel fermented with no oak maturation at all. It is a typical, fresh and forward drinking style with plenty of character and will hopefully rejuvenate your perception of this well-known wine name. Now, it has to be said that the words of Val Policella and cooperative in the same sentence may suggest how good is the wine going to be and I think rest assured. This to me is an absolutely terrific wine. Uh, and I think with both Val Policella as a wine, uh, very much like Suave, uh, has been much abused in the past. 
Uh, so it's been very much a question of get to know the producers, get to know the places that are producing the best examples. There's an ocean load of Val Policella out there, just as there is Suave. So, you know, a bit of time and effort in researching that really does pay dividends. But also with cooperatives, uh, cooperatives have often had a bad name. And uh, I think that, you know, over the last sort of 10, 15, even 20 years, quality coming out of cooperatives has improved enormously. Now, the Cantina Valpantena that we're tasting here now uh, is top, one of Italy's top cooperatives, uh, very, very high quality. And uh, I think that becomes even more apparent uh, when you learn that Matt Thompson, uh, who is a New Zealand winemaker, flying winemakers, made wines all over the world, uh, spends quite a lot of his time here making wines with them. So what we have here is 2018 Valpolicella, uh, characterised very typically, um, sort of pale uh, to medium red in colour, which is what you'd expect from any Valpolicella. That's a little bit deeper than, uh, than average. And then nose-wise. Now, first of all, smells of fruit. Uh, nice, fresh, strawberry, cherry, raspberry. Uh, very sort of easy uh, on the nose, first off. A um, little bit of spice there, just lurking in the background. And then palette-wise, Now, clean, good acidity, but as perhaps you might be familiar with in the past, acidity can perhaps be too prevalent in Valpolds, where they've perhaps extracted a bit too much uh, from the grapes. Uh, but this has got a lovely balance. You know, it's a nice, ripe, easy drinking fruit, uh, nice, well-balanced acidity, um, a nice sort of fruity finish. Terrifically versatile wine. Uh, it's still got, you know, surprising depth. Uh, you know, A for being a cooperative wine, but also I also comment that the, the Falasco range from the cooperative is their flagship range. So, you know, this is the sort of the best range of Valpolicella that the cooperative makes. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm still getting a resounding finish even now. Uh, so I think that's testament to its quality. And again, all stainless steel, all on oak, no wood at all. Now, as far as food matching is concerned, uh, cheese, first of all. Now, this is Puzzone di Moena, one of my favourite Italian cheeses. Uh, cow's milk washed rind. So uh, when they're sort of maturing the cheese, they brush the rind uh, with uh, a, a salty brine, and that just adds to sort of the pungency uh, within the cheese. Um, Semi-soft, cow's milk, um, and you know, quite pungent, quite flavoursome. But I feel this bad Policella has got enough oomph to sort of match with it absolutely perfectly. Now, Recipe wise, I think this would be absolutely super with one of my favourite Italian dishes, particularly midweek, a melanzani alla parmigiana. So baked aubergines, tomato sauce, a lovely grating of uh, parmesan cheese with a sprinkle of basil. Super. Okay, our second red is the Barolo 2015 from Massolino. Massolino is one of the great Barolo names. The 23 hectare estate has been in family hands since 1896. We had the pleasure of visiting on tour in 2006, albeit after a three course lunch had turned into 11 courses. Since 1994, Franco Massolino has overseen a change in winemaking style that marries tradition with innovation and modernization. And the net result has been to establish Massolino Barolos in the Premier League of Producers. The wine is made from 100% Nebbiolo and was matured in large oak casks for 30 months, followed by a year in bottle before release. Now, this Barolo from Massolino, uh, without question, uh, one of my favourite estates, the Massolino estate, and uh, particularly fond memories of visiting Massolino back in 2005. We met Franco Massolini himself, he hosted the tasting, and it has to be said, some of us were somewhat worse for wear because it was an afternoon visit. Uh, we'd be promised a three course lunch, uh, which turned into an 11 course extravaganza. So it required the most intense of resolve to actually stay awake and conscious while visiting one of Barolo's most renowned estates. But we held firm and uh, I was proud of everyone for the effort they made as we consumed another gallon or six of fine Italian wines. So, Barolo, one of the world's most famous wines, uh, characterised by this pale colour, the Nebbiolo grape, 
uh, gives this sort of very sort of uh, lightish sort of uh, red juice, um, but it's incredibly tannic. And this is one of the features of, of Nebbiolo and particularly Barolo, it needs time. So this has been aged for 30 months in the large oak barrels or botti, uh, as they say in Italy, and uh, followed by a further year in the bottle. So, you know, it's quite an extended period of aging prior to release onto the market. Um, so colour-wise, as you can see, you know, it's pretty pale. Now on the nose, intense. Earth, leather, spice, tar, uh, all those sort of characteristics, um, you know, sort of real sort of deep, intense fruit. Then, moving on to the palate. As you might expect, real concentration, real intensity. Uh, now those tannins, uh, given this is 2015 uh, from the full size bottle, it's got uh, lovely concentration. Uh, hopefully you would have decanted this uh, for a good eight to ten hours before, uh, as per the instructions, highly recommend that. And that just gives the air time to just sort of let it soften uh, a bit in the decanter. But palette wise, you know, lovely depth, lovely weight, spicy earthy fruit. Um, lovely concentration, the finish goes on for ages and ages. Uh, you know, you, I love this style of wine, it's probably clear to everyone watching this. Turning to the 2016 Barolo in half bottle, uh, the you know, colour not dissimilar, perhaps slightly deeper than the 2015, uh, and hopefully you followed my recommendation, was to give this a really, really good decant many hours before you actually taste it. Uh, and certainly that gives the wine air you know, and the opportunity just to sort of open out uh, in, in a larger uh, vessel. Uh, so nose-wise, um, characteristic, that intense, that, uh, that concentration, uh, earthy, uh, perhaps a little bit more austere, a little bit more closed than the 2015, uh, but not a huge amount. And certainly the aeration in decanter has helped. Uh, but you know it's earthy, it's farmyard, it's uh, you know, blackberry fruit, uh, absolutely sort of super, but still very young, of course. On the palate, the characteristic tannins that you'd expect from a Barolo of this sort of caliber, this sort of quality, clearly present. Um, you know it's still very young, but again, you know having had the uh, the eight hours in the decanter. That has opened now, it has softened, it doesn't feel unapproachable, uh, but clearly this is a wine that you'd have with food. You know, it's not something for quaffing uh, you know, mid-afternoon. Uh, mid so uh, those tannins will benefit from uh, you know, probably a, a meat main course, we'll just soften those out. But it's got a lovely length, lovely finish, uh, lovely intensity, uh, absolutely characteristic of top-class Barolo. You know, this is uh, a fantastic wine paired with uh, suggestions, food-wise, uh, I think a wild boar ragu uh, would be absolutely spot on with this. Uh, and then cheese wise, now something that uh, I'm a big favourite of, that you'll find it's into cheese, uh, it's called Pecorino di Fossa. Um, and I call this my uh, ditch matured uh, pecorino. But, but basically what they do is they, uh, they make the cheese, uh, then they take it out into caves wrap it in sort of straw and herbs uh, and let it sort of um, uh, just develop uh, for a few months. Not quite outside, but uh, certainly in a sort of a, um, yeah, a fairly sort of cool uh, outside environment. And then they bring it in for the final sort of uh, the final finish. Uh, absolutely beautiful cheese, lovely depth and intensity, and it's got that concentration and weighted taste that will go perfectly with this Barolo. So cheers everyone. Our final wine in the lineup of seven wines is the Contero Moscato d'Asti 2019. The Marenko family are incredibly generous with their hospitality and time. They serve wonderful lunches in their vineyard farmhouse, and we have enjoyed their delightfully light Moscato d'Asti with pan fried bites of ravioli as well as fresh strawberries, though not at the same time. Every time I crack open a bottle, it brings back memories of some of the best experiences we've ever had on tour. This wine, made from 100% Moscato grapes and at a mere 5.5% alcohol, there is no excuse not to regularly refresh one's palate. This wine is produced by, without a doubt, my favourite wine family, the Marenkos. 
and we first met uh, their Marenko family back in 2006 and it has to rank as probably one of the most joyous, fun, delightful wine tasting experiences as we gorged ourselves on the most delicious home cooked food in their farmhouse out in the vineyards and were just totally indulged in what to me is the essence of Italy. It's that warmth of hospitality, uh, the generosity of food, time and inevitably wine. Uh, yeah, we've been back a number of times and every time we get the most fantastic experience. So it's always a joy to be tasting and drinking the wines of uh, the Cantera, the Marenco estate. Uh, originally, it was owned actually by La Giustiniana, uh, previously of, uh, of the Garvey White that we tasted earlier. Uh, but uh, the Marencos, they are experts in um, the sparkling wines of the region. So the Moscato d'Asti and also the Brochetta de Quille, which is the lightly sparkling red. Now, there's Asti uh, and there's Moscato d'Asti. Now, Moscato d'Asti is the higher quality of the two. Both are low alcohol. Asti is normally about seven, seven and a half percent, whereas Moscato d'Asti, five and a half percent. So very light, very refreshing, uh, and that sort of natural sweetness uh, coming from that unfermented uh, grape sugars. Now, typically, uh, you drink Moscato d'Asti fairly young. It's not a wine to put in the cellar to age. Uh, and you can see from the colour, very sort of pale, very, very light in colour. Nose-wise, very clean, very fresh, lightly honeyed, uh, white flowers, um, you know, just a essence of sort of fresh summer sweetness uh, coming through on the nose. Uh, and then palette-wise, really is quite sweet. Um, and um, yeah, it's not sticky, so it's good, that little bit of fizz, that little prickle of uh, effervescence uh, keeps it from being cloying. Uh, lovely length, lovely finish. 100% Moscato or Muscat grapes, and the perfect accompaniment for this uh, is fresh strawberries uh, and a very, very light, uh, either chocolate sauce um, or just a bit of whipped cream uh, is absolutely perfect. Uh, I haven't got a cheese to recommend with this. Uh, strawberries and cream, strawberry and chocolate sauce, do it for me. So that concludes our tasting for the Richmond and Tellington Wine Societies. Our focus having been on Northern Italian wines. Can I just say, once again, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the wines. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, hopefully you've seen uh, some improvements and changes uh, from our first video uh, last month. Uh, and I'd like to take this opportunity of uh, enormous thanks to Julia uh, for doing the editing, the thinking, the just about everything really uh, in the production of the video. So thanks very much. See you next month.